Welcome, and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants will be in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's call. At that time, you may press star 1 to ask a question from the phone lines. I'd like to inform all parties that today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I'd now like to turn the call over to Ms. Irene I here. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. Hello and welcome to today's FDA webinar to discuss the recently published final guidance document titled 510K Program, Evaluating Substantial Equivalence in Pre-Market Notifications. I am Irene Ihear of CDRH's Office of Communication and Education, and I'll be your moderator for today's discussion. On July 28, FDA published the final guidance document, which clarifies the current regulatory framework, policies and practices of the 510K pre-market review process. Today, Marjorie Shulman, the Director of the Pre-Market Notification Program in CDRH's Office of Device Evaluation, will present an overview of the guidance document. Following Marjorie's presentation, we will open the call for questions. At that time, Marjorie and several other regulatory experts from CDRH will be available to provide clarif clarification and answer questions. Today's slide presentation audio recording, and written transcript will be available on the CDRH Learn section of the FDA website. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Marjorie. Thank you. Welcome. My name is Marjorie Shulman, and I want to thank you for taking your time today to listen to this presentation. We hope you find it helpful and informative. First, I'll start with a little background. K86-3 Blue Book Memorandum, the guidance on the CDRH Pre-Market Notification Review Program, also known as 510K, issued on June 30, 1986. There is a general discussion uh, regarding the process of determining substantial equivalence between a new device and a predicate device. It issued prior to FDA implementation of good guidance practices. The new 510K paradigm, or alternate approaches to demonstrating substantial equivalence in pre-market notification guidance uh, document issued March 20, 1998. It introduced the special and abbreviated 510K programs, and it explains the differences between traditional, special, and abbreviated 510Ks with respect to the scope and submission content. Neither uh, document has been updated since uh, neither document has been updated since initial publication. So for the background, the draft guidance document evaluating substantial equivalence in pre-market notification 510K issued December 28, 2011. There is a grand undertaking, undertaking by a number of dedicated FDA's, FDA employees who put in a lot of time, effort, and thought into this document. It's intended to offer greater clarity on topics discussed in K86-3 and the new 510K paradigm guidance documents. We received over 400 comments. Most of the comments were on the special 510K technological characteristics, and predicate device sections. FDA carefully reviewed uh, all the comments and modified the draft guidance document to address those. We do believe we uh, reviewed all the comments and took each one into consideration, and as a result, we did, as I just said, uh, modify the uh, document. So the draft guidance document was revised to give a clearer, to clearly, clearer explanation and the intent and value of the primary predicate concept, which I'll explain a bit later, include more examples to illustrate FDA's decision-making process, which we hope you will find very helpful, and include an, uh, an appendix with a sample 510K summary to demonstrate the level of detail expected in each session, a section, which I'll also go into more detail later. 
In response to the comments, there, were, there was industry concern relating to the inclusion of the special 510K program section, given the connection to deciding when to submit a new 510K for device modifications. So we heard you. And in response, the special and abbreviated sections were removed. FDA intends to finalize these sections separately, and the new 510K paradigm guidance remains in effect. So now we'll move on to the discussion of the final guidance. We are announcing the availability of the guidance titled the 510K Program Evaluating Substantial Equivalence in Pre-Market Notification 510K. It describes FDA's current review practices for 510K submissions by describing the regulatory framework, policies, and underlying practices. It does replace K86-3 guidance, and it was issued in accordance with FDA's DGP regulation, 21 CFR 10.115. The guidance highlights is there is a flowchart modification, discussion of new terms, illustrative examples for different not substantially equivalent categories, and a 510K summary context. context uh, content explanation. <laughs> I know what I'm saying. Um, we'll get into further detail on these subjects in the following slides. For so the flowchart modification, it's been previously unmodified since its introduction in K86-3, and it is updated to incorporate statutory terminology, and the language mirrors Section 513I of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and 21 CFR 807.100. It is cosmetically reorganized It's for increased clarity and visually streamlined. It is available in Appendix A of the guidance document and is not intended to be used as a standalone document. The most important message about this flowchart is the decision points did not change. We've introduced some new terms, primary predicate and reference device. Primary predicate is the device, the identified predicate with indications and technology most similar to the device subject, uh, to the subject device when multiple predicates are identified. And this can facilitate a timely review and well-supported decision. A reference device is a legally marketed device intended to provide scientific information to support safety and effectiveness. Reference device is not a predicate and cannot be used to support decision points one through four on the flowchart. There are illustrative examples of each in the guidance document, and there's a glossary of significant terminology in Appendix D. Other terms that may not sound familiar are, one, multiple predicates, which is where two or more predicate devices that have been provided to support an SE decision. If using multiple predicate devices to demonstrate substantial equivalence, each predicate device must have the same intended use as the new device and any different technological characteristics between the new device and the predicate must not raise different questions of safety and effectiveness. Multiple predicates can also include devices such as a multi-perimeter monitor, and a device construct. Examples are available in the guidance document. And everyone's favorite term, split predicate, which is using one legally marketed device for intended use and a different legally marketed device for technological characteristics to demonstrate substantially equivalent. The use of uh, split predicates is inconsistent with the 510K regulatory standard. Um, as we try to clarify this in the guidance, you do uh, not need a primary predicate. You do need a primary predicate to get you through all the way through the flowchart. This is not a change from how we have made decisions in the past. So the illustrative examples, the NSC categories are unchanged and fully explained. We have lack of predicate, new intended use, different questions of safety and effectiveness, and inadequate performance data. 
The first three remove the device from the 510K pathway. The fourth inadequate performance data allows the device to be resubmitted as a 510K with the adequate data. We also uh, have multiple examples of each NSE type described in the guidance. And finally, in one guidance document, we have discussed both intended use and indication for use. The 510K summary is part of this uh, guidance document, and the guidance includes additional discussion and examples on 510K summary requirements and context. Appendix B is a discussion on the 510K summary document requirements, and it provides clarification to facilitate compliance with 510K summary content requirements, which can be found under 21 CFR 807.92. Each subpart of the regulation is explained with suggested contact, content. Appendix C is a sample of a compliant 510K summary, and that's intended to provide an example of the format and the content expected. The information required in the summary follows 21 CFR 807.92. We believe by following these requirements, the summaries will be more helpful to companies by showing what information was required for the predicate and will increase transparency. A file will not be refused during the refuse to accept process for missing information in the summary. This will be a substantive review item, but the summary should contain all the elements outlined in the regulation. One of my favorite sayings by George Bernard Shaw is the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. We hope you find this guidance helpful and it's clarifying the 510K program for you. We want to continue the communication, so comments on this final guidance may be submitted at any time to the following website at uh, electronic comments www.regulations.gov. Uh, we will now take any questions on this guidance or comments or accolades. Uh, thank you for participating. You can send your questions to the Division of Industry and Consumer Education at dice at fda.hhs.gov. And for more information on the regulation of medical devices, please visit CDRH Learn and Device Advice in the Medical Device section of fda.gov. Thank you. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question from the phone lines, please press star 1. You will be prompted to unmute your phone and record your name. Again, it's star 1 to ask a question. One moment, please, for the first question. And there are no questions in queue at this time. I think we should just give it a few more minutes. Um, can you just double check to make sure all of the callers understand how to prompt for questions? Absolutely. Again, to ask a question from the phone lines, please press star 1. Okay, and one moment, we do have a question in queue. And our first question comes from Sam Mirza. Sir, your line is open. Hi, uh, this is Sam Mirza from uh, Philips Healthcare. Um, uh, Mr. Roman, I think you alluded to it in your presentation that special and abbreviated 510K are excluded from this guidance. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. But they still are in effect under the uh, new 510K paradigm. 
We I got in the draft that came out, it was included all in the draft that we addressed specials and abbreviated, but now it's been, um, we removed it from this guy in stock document and the other one is still in effect. So we, that has not changed at all. We are still accepting them. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we can take the next caller, please. Thank you. And our next question comes from Greg Levine. Sir, your line is open. Yes, hi. Thank you. This is uh, Greg Levine with Ropes and Gray. Uh, thank you for the presentation and the guidance. <clears throat> um, I have a question about if, the the use of the primary predicate by FDA. And I was wondering if you could explain a little more about the purpose of that and the function it will serve from FDA's perspective. And in particular, I'm thinking because the FDA has said it will accept multiple predicates, um, particularly if you have a device that's combining features uh, from other previously clear devices, uh, you know, what? It, so if I have, let's say, a device that's combining features from two previously clear devices, what is the purpose of identifying a predicate? Because it seems like in some instances that could be frankly, somewhat something of an arbitrary determination, which one's predicate versus, uh, which one's primary versus non-primary. Thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, the purpose of the uh, primary predicate is the device with the indications and uh, for use and the technological characteristics that are most similar to the new device. So it should be identified with, within the 5K submission. The multiple predicates are certainly allowed also but you need one primary predicate to get you all the way through the flow chart. Sometimes two things could be equal and you are just picking one to be the primary predicate. You can also, would, uh, for a multi-perimeter monitor, you could have the primary predicate uh, be that monitor so it's really a combination of a lot of devices. Um, I'm sorry, what was the other part of the question? Was well, I mean, that, you know, I guess I guess that answers the piece of the question that addresses whether you, you know, the decision, frankly, could be, you know, flip a coin in some cases. I, I guess what I'm really trying to understand is when, you know, why is why is FDA requiring a primary? You know, what is what is the role of that, and you know, how does that, frankly, matter? So that's not new to the program. We've always required a primary predicate, and it's really to determine the substantial equivalence. So you need a legally marketed predicate device, and the legally marketed predicate device can be one that's been 510 k would It could be one that was um, pre-amendment device. It could be one that's been reclassified or de novo device. So that's your primary predicate, but then you may change the indication or the technology and that's where you might bring in other examples. But you have one primary predicate that has the overall intended use of the device that you're looking to market. Thank you. And our next question comes from Patricia Lehman. Your line is open. Hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is Patricia Lehman from EmuCore, and uh, I was just wondering if you could tell me if the, if the agency anticipates that there will be any changes on the application forms that might reflect any kind of new term in the new guidance. I'm sorry, the changes on the application form? Yes. Oh, the cover sheet. Are, are you talking about the cover sheet for uh, yes. any of the forms? Yes. Yes, we, we are looking to update any forms that do need to be updated uh, for these changes, um, and then we're just looking to update that anyway to make um, some just uh, cosmetic changes that were needed anyway. But um, we will announce those when they do come out. Um, in the meantime, you're welcome to use the forms that are out there. They're still valid for, for logging in any 510K or any application. And um, the information that we pull off of them is, is the same for the trade name and the company name and the uh, email address, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from J.D. Sir, your line is open. Yes, uh, thank you very much. My name is Jardin Crépon, calling you from uh, 
and it is corporation in Ottawa. Uh, so anyway, the question is not exactly on the guidance, but on the mechanism to uh, provide the information to the FDA. Is the uh, electronic method is the only method to be used to communicate with the FDA for submission of a 510K? Yes, that's a good question. We do require an electronic copy of your 510K at this point, an electronic copy and a hard copy. Um, we don't accept just a hard copy. So we do have an uh, electronic submission guidance document that's available on the web yes. that can walk you through that on uh, how to submit that. So any information submitted to us, even as a supplement or um, anything that comes through the document center, should include an electronic copy. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from James Fedorka. Sir, your line is open. Uh, yes, hi, uh, James Fedorka from Sylvan Fiber Optics. Uh, we're, um, we have a uh, product that was 510K back in 1991 been around for a while, and uh, we're looking to, uh, we're exploring an, another product that would be, uh, we feel is uh, substantially equivalent to the product we have. Uh, but I guess uh, if you could please explain to me what a split predicate is, please. So a split predicate is uh, what we do not accept and we haven't accepted in the, in the past. Maybe I'm sure someone out there probably can come up with an example where we have. But a split predicate is where you're taking one legally marketed predicate device um, okay. And it doesn't get all the way through the flow chart. It might be not substantially equivalent for a new intended use. And at that point, you're bringing in another predicate to get it further down the flow chart in technology. So uh, really, it's kind of like a um, – it really doesn't have a full predicate that can get you all the way through the flow chart. It's um, almost an imaginary device at, at this point because we don't have a legally marketed predicate device for it. Oh, okay. Well, so our product then is, uh, is already 510-8, and the new product, which will be manufactured, will be actually private labeled for us. Uh, it's 510-K, it, but uh, as a, um, I'm not sure if it's going to meet exactly the wording, so to speak, in all 510-K that we originally filed. That's, that's okay. That's the beauty of the 510-K process. You don't have to be exactly like your predicate. Uh, you can have a new indication for use or new technology. Okay, great. Great. Well, very good. Well, thank you very much. Very informative. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Bob Hoy. Your line is open. Hi, Bob Hoy from Surgical Frontiers here. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I had a question about the uh, reference device example one in the guidance. Um, and, and I read it through, it seemed like the actual subject device and the predicate device, the subject device would have made it all the way through the flow chart without the reference device. So my question is, what what is the purpose of the reference device? If, if the rationale or the performance data is enough to, um, to tell us that uh, the difference in technological characteristics raises known issues of safety or effectiveness, why would a, a reference device be included? So we're not saying you need a reference device uh, per se. We're saying if you have a reference device that may help uh, the review, then, then it's certainly um, helpful to add that. If you can get all the way through the flowchart with just the predicate device, a reference device is not needed. If there's some information that we may uh, gain from the reference device that may be it's a material that's been used before, so we know what kind of testing or questions are asked or um, um, the, the material of the device itself or anything like that. That's going to be helpful in the review. Um, but it's not a requirement to have the reference device. It's just any other information you may know about the uh, your device that you think would be helpful um, in showing substantial equivalence. Okay, so even though it has different indication for use, the technology has been cleared and it's helpful to understand how it was cleared. 
Right. So that's that's uh, helpful for us and, and probably helpful for you, too, if you look at um, the other companies' uh, 510K summary, and especially one of these new ones that will appear on the web soon, that they will show you what testing was required for that technology. And um, because as previously before and now, new indications uh, go through 510K all the time. So does uh, different technology as long as it doesn't raise different questions of safety and effectiveness. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Molly. Ma'am, your line is open. Mm -hmm. My question has been answered. Thanks. Thank you. And our next question comes from Ivan Stengel. Your line is open. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. Um, I uh, am participating only via the audio, and I don't have access to um, I didn't have access to the slides, so this may have been more obvious in the slides. But uh, if we're developing technology that uh, appears to have substantial equivalence to uh, legally marketed devices, but it's a new application in um, a new part of the body, uh, would that then require additional demonstration of efficacy and safety for that particular new use? I would uh, say yes. So we're going to look at the um, indication of where on the body it's being used, and then um, that's probably going to need some kind of data. I would probably suggest that you submit a pre-submission to the division to make sure that everyone's on the same page before you go off and, and uh, do any uh, studies for the data. Um, so that's, that's a tool available for you, too. But that's probably going to need uh, data. Okay. All right. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Lorraine Calzetta. Your line is open. Um, yes, hi. Um, good afternoon. Um, my question um, is regarding the actual uh, designation of the primary predicate. Is FDA now requiring us to actually state in the submission this is the primary predicate, or is it just inferred as you go down the checklist that this is the primary? And uh, Because I think another gentleman might have stated that sometimes it, there's a gray area because you actually have two that could both be primary predicates, and you're trying to combine and give a lot of information regarding the fact that you have a couple of predicates that could fit the bill. So, um, and then in terms of a reference device, do they want you to actually state this is a reference device or you're just using the back of information in there? We would, that's a, that's a great question and we should have made that clearer. We would uh, love for you to, to clearly label what is the predicate device and what are the reference devices. Um, that's going to help us kind of uh, build like a predicate tree on what was substantially equivalent to what and, and go back in time that way. And then the reference devices, um, we know if all things being equal and there's two primary predicates, well then really you just get to pick one. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, just in addition, if there are two, um, it, you would pick the one with the higher class and uh, the one most like the, the device you're claiming equivalence to. But if all those things are equal, then you would just pick one. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for your assistance. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question comes from Steve Giambo. Sorry, your line is open. Thank you very much. Ms. Shulman, uh, my name is Steve Ziamba. Hey, I'm a little bit confused on the difference between splitting predicates or, or splitting infinities, perhaps, is what is a better way to look at that and multiple predicates. In other words, I believe what you said was a split predicate um, is a device that, are, at least one device, has a different intended use, whereas multiple predicates would have the same intended use, except I heard you say several times that you could use the 510K process to um, expand or add new uh, intended uses or indications, uh, which I would presume would have needed some data from either um, uh, some sort of safety and effectiveness study or from uh, another predicate. 
so if I can't bring it in as a split predicate and I can't bring it in as a multiple predicate, how do I bring it in? So, um, no, that's a good clarification. And you're right that, that the difference in indication for user technology probably would require some kind of data. Um, what we're saying for a split predicate is that you don't have one uh, predicate device that can get you all the way through the flow chart. And that was not allowed previously in the 510K program, and we just clarified it for this guidance document. So what you're talking about, if you're using um, a, a reference device or um, a, another predicate, you can bring that in as long as you have one primary predicate that gets you all the way through the flow chart. So to use the example, that, well, to use the, you know, the example in the um, guidance document, you know, you've got a, a knee implant, whatever it was in there, that you know, is cleared with you know, material A and whatever the indicated use is. And say, so, well, I want to bring in another uh, knee implant that's um, uh, you know, made from a different uh, material, um, and maybe it's for a slightly different population, like maybe an older or younger population. Is that appropriate to use as a multiple predicate? That's a multiple predicate. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's a reference device. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. But, so, oh, hold on one second. Right. This is this is Dr. Joni Foy from um, the Office of Device Evaluation. Yes, so just to clarify, the example that you're talking about is actually a reference device. We don't consider a reference device a predicate. Um, when you are utilizing multiple predicates, it is two or more devices that you can walk all the way through the flow chart. And so the distinction that we're trying to make with identification of a primary predicate is to pick the one predicate that you think is most similar to your product. It's not a requirement that you have to only identify one, but it helps to streamline the review process because we look and your characterization and comparison is done to that particular product. So that's the impetus for a primary predicate is to try to streamline both the testing that you do on your end as well as the review process on the agency's side. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Foy. Thank you. And our next question comes from Craig Combs. Sir, your line is open. Hi, this is Craig Combs, Combs Medical Device Consulting. Uh, Ms. Shulman, uh, we're still um, trying to, to sort through this issue of when different technological characteristics raise new questions of safety and effectiveness. And you provided uh, several examples, and I'd like to focus in on that first one that you did of showing that different technologies have the same intended use as far as serving as biological indicators. Uh, that's on page 21. Um, our, you know, I just, when I look at that uh, specific example, I don't see that they do raise new questions of safety and efficacy. I mean, the main questions of safety and efficacy for any diagnostic like that are sensitivity, specificity, false positive, false negative. They're the same for both assays. Now, certainly they do raise different testing methodologies because they have different technology, different testing methodologies to show that they meet the same criteria. I just, what we're not understanding particularly because I don't want this to be chilling on innovation, how is the need for different uh, ways of testing the methodology interpreted as new safety and effectiveness questions? So we look at that because these questions were not asked with the predicate device, and that's what we consider a different question of technology. Um, So that would be a question that wasn't asked with the predicate device, and that's why it would be different. Um, again, that, that's not new to the decision-making process. Those are ones that we would have found not substantially equivalent before the issuance of this uh, guidance document. Um, I, I can understand what you're saying. that it, You may not uh, read it the same way, but that's what we believe, that it is a different question of technology because it was not asked in the predicate. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Robin Statzinger. Your line is open. Hi, this is Robin Statzinger calling in from ASCII Lab. Um, thank you for your presentation. And, and a follow-up uh, to the last question, and, and I think it kind of leads into my question. So I, I think one of the things that we're a little
little concerned about are if we use a predicate that has a 510K from maybe five to ten years ago or even further back, a lot of times the information in a 510K summary is pretty vague. It doesn't have as much detail as what FDA is now um, requesting in this guidance. So we may not know um, whether the agency had evaluated certain um, aspects of safety and effectiveness in that review. So I guess then my question would be, does FDA expect to receive a lot more de novo requests? And some of these de novo requests may come after an NSC letter. So it seems like in the guidance there's a lot of examples of when you would get an NSC, and based on maybe some of the things I'm hearing now, it sounds like there may be a lot more NSC letters that are going to be um, given out to industry and therefore perhaps more de novo requests. Yes, thank you for your comment. We do not expect the NSC rate to, to increase. We do not expect to issue more NSC determinations. Um, if you had a question on uh, what information was uh, required for maybe the predicate device, you could always submit uh, QSUB and, and discuss it with the division. Um, but we're looking for the change in your technology from the predicate that would be a different question of safety and effectiveness. So um, that you don't necessarily have to know from the summary what was asked in the other, in, in the in the predicate 510K. You can also uh, request the file through Freedom of Information if you're interested in that. And that's why we're hoping that these uh, summaries, that the part of the reg that's been uh, in the regulation uh, since uh, the inception of the summary and the statement is going to help with questions exactly like this. Thank you. One, just one other follow-up question. Um, does FDA uh, feel that this guidance will have any effect on bundled 510Ks? No, we do not feel that it should change anything about bundling the 510Ks. If you could bundle before, you can bundle now. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Elaine Lee. Your line is open. Thank you. Thanks for the webinar and the chance to uh, ask questions. Uh, this is Elaine Lee from Intuitive Surgical. Uh, my question is also on reference devices. I was a little confused by um, uh, one of your slides that said a reference device cannot be used uh, for a decision point on the flowchart, but in the guidance it talks about um, using the reference device for um, supporting scientific methodology for at decision point 5A. So I was wondering if you could just clarify what the distinction was um, regarding what, what you're trying to say about not being used at a uh, decision point. So basically that kind of ties into the split predicate. You can't use a reference device to bring in another predicate to get you past that decision point if you don't have a legally marketed device that can get you all the way through the flow chart okay. for the first four points, for the first four points on, on the flow chart. So um, that's why, um, but it certainly is going to be helpful uh, to the reviewer and, to, and uh, for you to, to include that so we know what kind of information you're looking for. So that, that's all we meant by that for the reference uh, device, that it shouldn't be to get you further down the flow chart, but it certainly has a uh, part in the review. So, so you mean that it, you can't use your reference device to get you through the first four decision points? Is that what you're Correct. Asking? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, the intended use, the uh, predicate, the legally marked predicate device, the intended use, the technology. Thank you. And our next question comes from Claude Berthorn. Sir, your line is open. Yes, good afternoon, Mrs. Uh, Schulman. Uh, this is Claude Berthorn. I'm with John Gillespie of Enterprise International, a uh, FDA consultant. Uh, we've talked to you before. Thank you for your presentation. And nice to talk to you again. I take the opportunity today to ask you if you have any plan to open a new category down the road of 510K uh, in the future 
for lack of a better name, I'm calling, I'm labeling this category a Me Too product. Uh, and let me define what I'm thinking about. This is when the same device is already cleared multiple times by independent OEM of the same manufacturer. Obviously, the situation is the manufacturer did not file a 510K, and then, uh, you know, that part component is actually a full device, and each distributor uh, is filing a 510K. So FDA already has the information, already has all the tests, safety and effectiveness has been demonstrated. We're wondering why, uh, how we could shortcut uh, in a way, a device that's already been approved and in the knowledge of the, of the FDA. Uh, as an example, uh, uh, there is a manufacturer of a dental sensor in France who then is important in the U.S., and there is eight companies that have filed the exact same sensor under different names, et cetera, uh, and uh, we're about to do a ninth one, and we're kind of, like, frustrated. We think this uh, should be... Uh, uh, simplified and, and certainly uh, equivalency has been demonstrated. So thank you for your question. I do understand what you're saying. And you're right. If the uh, person had filed a 510K, then the private label distributors would be exempt under the 510K program, and that's in the regulations. We don't exactly. have any right. We, we don't have any plans of, of making a, uh, another type of 510K. Um, has anyone talked to the manufacturer and suggested that they submit a 510K? We have, actually. Uh, they don't want to consider themselves a medical device manufacturer, and that's kind of an odd situation because of the uh, physical characteristic of the device. Uh, you know, they are an uh, electronic wafer company, but actually the device they produce is the exact device Software is simply the additional components, but there are already three companies using the same software. So that's kind of a odd situation. We wish we could have access uh, or get, uh, that FDA reviewers would have access to the information and could say, yeah, you're right, it's the same thing. You know, let's take a shortcut. Uh, we have a ruling here or a uh, uh, specific category that allows uh, Me Too products, if I can call them that way, um, uh, and we understand there are legal issues of reviewing other people's file, but uh, on the other hand, this would simplify the work at FDA. The, manu the, the distributor is always willing to pay the fee, and, you know, if the product is the same, and, you know, uh, we think that there should be something about this issue. Uh, right. I, I understand what you're saying, and we may have to discuss this later uh, offline. Um, there is something I can discuss with you later about a master file. Maybe that company would like to submit a master file, and there's no charge for that, and put that uh, proprietary information in the master file, then the other ones could reference it. They're still going to have to submit a 510K, but I think we may want to discuss this later offline. Thank you so very much. I look forward to do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And the next question comes from Cheryl Wagoner. Ma'am, your line is open. Hello, this is Sheriff Wagner. Thank you for the presentation today. I just had a quick question. You had mentioned about the there will be additional guidance on special and um, abbreviated. Do you have an estimated timeline for when that may happen? Um, that's a great question, and no, I don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, not uh, this year. I think that's a safe bet. Late in the year for that already. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry. Sorry, don't have a better answer. Thank you. And the next question comes from Kelly Kawarukochip. Your line is open. Hello. Thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. Uh, my name is Kelly Kawarukochip, and I work with Stryker. Uh, my question is in regard to combination devices. So I noticed here that the guidance is signed off by CDRH and CBER. And I guess my question is more or less, when you have a combination product, you're taking two regulated components that have, um, say they have the same intended use, but when you add them together, you're inherently altering the technological characteristics. Um, is, is this kind of indicating that uh, without being able to use split product at most, combination products would have to be 
uh, would have to go down the path of either a de novo or a PMA. Um, so that may be a bit specific for this because we do have plenty of uh, 510K devices that may have a drug component or uh, a biological component. It doesn't necessarily mean it would be not substantially equivalent. Um, we may have to go to the off the combination products to see who, which center would take the lead on it. Um, okay, I mean, but go ahead. So, would you be able to reference both if, if both of the you know the drug and the device were legally marketed beforehand? You would be able to talk to both of those, or would you have to pick one of those as a, a primary? Product? You would need to pick one as a primary predicate, and then if you're uh, adding the, the drug or the uh, biologic, but we may have to discuss this. Uh, if you have something specific in mind as opposed to just a general question, we'll probably want to discuss that with you before uh, you get down the path of, of submitting any kind of application to make sure it's not a, a NME or anything like that. All right, thank you. Yeah, new molecular entity. Thank you. And our next question comes from Abby Makuchi. Ma'am, your line is open. Um, hi, my question is around uh, primary and uh, predicate and uh, reference devices. Um, so for submissions that go in now, um, is it an FDA expectation that every submission, if there are multiple devices, clearly identify primary and uh, reference devices um, and if you didn't get did get a submission um, for the in the next month or so where a primary predicate was not identified clearly would you refuse to accept so no we would not refuse to accept it and anything that's currently under review we're not going to uh, contact the companies and go back and ask for which was the primary predicate and which were the uh, reference devices um, it's just for any ones in the future, and if you have one that you've already prepared and it's ready to be sent here, we don't expect you to uh, redo it at this time either. So it's not it's not going to be your refuse to accept item. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Harlow Tilke. Sir, your line is open. Yes, this is Harlow Tilke with Starkey here in Technologies. Uh, thank you for the uh, seminar and the chance to ask questions. Um, I was looking at your table and uh, I was wondering if you advocate uh, using that table as well for determining whether you need to send in a, a 510K for a modified device or if you can have use that to help you determine if a letter to file is sufficient. So no, this is not the guidance document that you would uh make that decision, you would go to the uh, when to submit a 510K for a change or modification. That document is still in effect, and um, that's the one that you would reference to make that decision on whether or not it's a significant change that would require a new 510K. Okay. All right. I understand. I just needed some clarification. Thank yeah. You. No, thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Raj. Sir, your line is open. Uh, yeah, hi, this is Raj Kaspekar, CAS USA. I think you actually already answered my question. My question was same, uh, similar to the one posed before as to when this is effective and if, uh, if we are submitting in the next uh, few weeks, would you expect uh, this new terminology? Uh, right. So for, for the reference device and all that, the summary, of course, we would expect to uh, follow the regulation but it will not be a refuse to accept item. Okay. Thank you. And our next question comes from Marcia Zucker. Ma'am, your line is open. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, I do a lot of work with point of care devices. And so we're working with whole blood devices. Usually we have a point of care predicate and a laboratory analyzer as a reference analyzer. Now, since the point of care predicate would get us through points one through four in the flow chart, 
Would it be then reasonable to assume that when doing the accuracy studies, the method comparison studies, be done to the reference is more or which is generally assumed to be closer to truth than another point of care device? That is an excellent question, which I do not have an answer for you right off the bat. I can tell you a couple things that you can do right now. The, there will be an IVD roundtable scheduled for Tuesday, November 18th, 2014. But in the meantime, we can have you contact our um, uh, division of IVD devices, and uh, they, they could help you with that specific question. I don't uh, have the response right here, um, but we would we will get you the response as soon as possible. So you can send it the question to the dice address at fda.hhs.gov, and we will certainly uh, get you a response. I'm sorry, I don't have a response for you now. Okay. Thank you very much. So I'll just send a note to the DICE email. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from John Beasley. Sir, your line is open. Thank you very much. Um, my question uh, relates to understanding all these definitions when you put them together. So, for example, we note that you have uh, definitions for intended use, you have definitions for indications for use, and then you have these new definitions for uh, primary predicate and multiple predicates. So when submitting a 510K for a change in the clinical context or the clinical setting, or, or the setting, so you're changing, for example, from clinical use to home use, all right, um, is it a correct assessment that you cannot use your own device as a primary predicate because your, your original device is cleared for the clinical use because, because of the difference in indications for use and, and, and intended use? No. Um, you can use your own device as the primary predicate, and you, you know the most about your device. The only reason maybe you would want to use another one is, is for any kind of maybe human factors testing or anything that you may have uh, gotten out of the other file to, to know what kind of data would be need, needed going from um, uh, one setting to another. But you certainly can use your own device as the primary predicate. Okay. All right. Well, all right. so thank you very much. Um, I'm, a little, I'm still a little confused because it sounds as if it's a split predicate in that case, but I'm not really sure. So maybe, maybe I should look at it a little further. Right. Now, you have a... We, we could look at it further, and I can further explain, but it, it's not necessarily a split predicate. You're just bringing in a um, reference device to, to show that this has been cleared for uh, the other setting. But Okay, Marjorie. Okay, thank you very much. We'll, we'll, we'll talk okay. further. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Brenda Howell. Ma'am, your line is open. Hi. We, uh, Rhonda Howell from IMDX. We we're wondering that, given the fact that you said it's necessary to choose a predicate, a primary predicate that will take you all the way through the flow chart, is there any advantage in FDA's eyes to submitting with multiple predicates if you already have one that carries you through the flow chart? No, that's totally your choice in, in making your best, uh, um, your best showing of, of how you're substantially equivalent to a legally marketed device. If there is one predicate and that gets you all the way through, that's perfectly fine. We're, we're not insisting on multiple predicates. It's just if there are additional ones that maybe can help the FDA with the review and then we can um, maybe leverage any of that kind of information or look up a previous decision to see what kind of questions were asked, that's where it may be helpful, but it's certainly not a requirement and plenty of devices uh, go through the process with just one predicate device. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and there are no other questions in queue at this time. Thank you. This is Irene I here. Thanks again for participating and for your questions today. Please remember that the slide presentation, audio recording, and written transcript of this webinar will be available on the CDRH Learn website in three to five business days. For this and other regulatory information, please visit our industry 
web resources at Device Advice and CDRH Learn in the medical device sections of FDA.gov. As always, we appreciate your feedback. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you. That concludes today's conference. Thank you for your participation. You may disconnect at this time.